Wanted. There is hardly a better word to describe PT than that one. Every inch of the game is soaked in ritual hauntings. There are spectres everywhere you look. The hallway of a destroyed family life, a bathroom, and a decrepit basement are all that the game needs to show you in order to suck you in, to fully immerse you, and to slowly degrade a regular environment towards a famous, distorted hell. The game is also haunted by a literal spectre, that of Lisa, the pregnant woman who was shot and murdered by her husband, and whose children were also all shot to death by their father, the same man. Lisa is the game's central antagonist, it seems, a verifiably paranormal force that stalks you with a perverse glee. But there is more yet to PT than surface-level hauntings, than merely what we see in front of us, than the traditional, staid, horror game scares. Quantology, the study of the effect of dead or gone things on society, or in the case of art, other mediums, is very, very relevant to PT. Jack Derrida's idea of quantology was first introduced in 1994 to grapple with the specter of Marx that loomed over Europe. It can now be used to understand how some phenomena or ideas seem to belong to the past and are supposedly long gone, but are, in fact, still present in social, cultural, and political discourses. Like spectres, they still actively influence the current state of affairs, and also taint the future. PT, perhaps more than any other video game, embodies this idea fully and potently. When PT was tragically cancelled, genuinely one of the saddest cancellations ever, if not the saddest in my mind, it did not die the quiet, ignominious death that Konami wanted for it. Instead, by virtue of PT's remarkable release and word-of-mouth premise, The very fact that it was gone merely encouraged the hype more. Human beings are funny like that. Take something away from them, tell them they can't have it, and their desire for it is merely inflamed. PT was released on August 12th, 2014, to zero fanfare. It just kind of... appeared. Released on the PlayStation Store, it was developed by a team that called themselves 7780S Studio. The name of the studio is itself a reference to Silent Hill, the franchise for which PT was intended as a teaser. 7780S refers to the area in square kilometers of Shizuoka Prefecture in Japan. A literal translation of the prefecture's name is Quiet Hills, and in Japan, the Silent Hill series is often nicknamed Shizuoka. Of course, as everyone knows, the game was actually developed by Hideo Kojima and his team at Kojima Productions, with Guillermo del Toro coming along as director. Junji Ito would have been a monster consultant for the full game, just in case you needed to feel any more depressed about the full game's non-existence. You can see Ito's influence particularly in the teaser when, in the final cycle, you see all of the eyeballs in the portraits. While PT was never intended to resemble what the full game was going to look like, It has still, nonetheless, shaped the last nine years of horror games and will continue to shape it invisibly as we go forwards. It might seem trite now just watching gameplay footage of it, but the recursive hallway, first-person perspective, and lack of any ability to defend yourself has obviously been a huge influence on countless video games, some I plan to cover very soon. PT's cleverest gameplay element is in fact its minimalism. The fact that the only way you can interact with the game world is to look closer at things is the very antithesis of what you want to do at that moment. PT is a game you want to stay away from, but yet to interface with it is to get close to it, feel its breath on your face as you press your hands into its innards, grope at the intestines of its most wretched sounds and noises. 
Your hands come away greasy with blood, and your mind rattling with the fear that is rarely ever, if ever, replicated in the digital medium. Much like the infamous sequence in Silent Hill 2, wherein James must jump progressively deeper into mysterious holes, taking him further and further into madness in the deep bowels of the earth, the player in PT must go through the same door time and time again, going down a small flight of stairs, watching as things decay around you. You go deeper and deeper. It is circular, cyclical. It is inspired and nasty. It is a simplification of the ideas presented in the Silent Hill games that came before it. A descent into madness, a decay of reality, presented more slowly yet more succinctly than ever before. It is a minimalist approach to Silent Hill, and it still frightens even despite that. Or, more likely, because of it. PT is also noteworthy in how it rejects masculine power and affords the chance for Lisa, the game's central antagonist, to get revenge on the presumably male protagonist. Where many monsters in other games act with mindless rage, or at least suffer from an inability to express themselves outside of violence, such as Silent Hill 3's God, Lisa is constantly heard to be weeping and laughing in equal measure, the two fusing together to create a dynamic soundscape of a woman who is both grieving the death of her children and enjoying the pain that she is causing. It was revealed by dedicated fans that Lisa is almost always behind the player, always staring. As Clover corroborates, horror is obsessively interested in the thought that the simple act of staring can terrify, maim, or kill its object. That a hard look and a hard penis, i.e. chainsaw, knife, power drill, amount to one and the same thing. PT's Lisa takes male monsterism and repurposes it. A hard stare and constant stalking, grunting her possessive power over the male protagonist. While PT criticizes toxic masculinity, it also empowers the woman in a perverse, posthumous way by having her kill him over and over again. The death animation implies that she castrates him, in fact, and entrap him forever within the house where she was forced to spend her adult life. PT is a landmark in the way gender works in horror games, as it is a genuine criticism of toxic masculinity and how women in games are presented. Lisa might be scary, but the biggest monster of PT might actually be you. These fascinating gendered ideas are outlined nicely in this essay by Lisa Cunningham, where she states, Barbara Creed outlines the ways in which monstrousness is located, both in film studies and in psychoanalytic tradition, directly in the se sexual difference of women. As Creed points out, all human societies have a conception of the monstrous feminine, of what it is about women that is shocking, terrifying, horrific, abject. By looking at the ways in which women are portrayed and understood as monstrous, we can understand how a society defines undesirable and thus desirable femininity. Simply speaking, PT affords the othered woman who was killed by the husband for his own self-doubt and fears an opportunity for revenge. For the husband and PT, undesirable femininity was breadwinning, as Lisa is implied to have gotten a job when the husband lost his and could no longer provide for the family. With his place in the hauntingly omnipresent patriarchal power structure lost, the husband lost his reason for living, and jealous paranoia consumed him, fueled by the flames of radio rhetoric. PT haunts the player through narrative power structures, critiquing classic gender positioning in horror films, male monster hunting female prey for instance, and reverses this. It relies on the usage of general knowledge of those power structures to haunt via context. Lisa problematizes the traditional relationship between video game monsters and their protagonists, much like previous Silent Hill games have done. We must grapple now with the unseen monster, or the monster within, a concept that is prominent in many of my favorite horror titles. When the monster is harder to define, or see, even if just at first, the story can become more interesting and more complex readings are able to be assigned to it. PT is also technologically haunted. The radio, typically such a large focus of previous Silent Hill games, returns here again in a big way. The radio in PT functions as both a callback to those previous games and a subversion of your expectations regarding it, as well as a use of older technology to create a more haunted environment. Because it is harder for us, right, to imagine a smartphone as being haunted, though there is always the spectre of AI. The usage of analog technology, however, harkens back to a past that feels particularly distant, yet still is present in our lives. PT's radio is both expository and strangely silent at times. In the first loop, it outlines the basic premise of the game's framing narrative before falling silent. 
Then later, resuming its broadcast, except with subtle differences in wording and with new words underlying them. The broadcaster reveals himself to have a strange, intimate knowledge with the murder, and reveals that the father hung himself with either a garden hose or an umbilical cord after he committed familicide. Yet the radio broadcaster can also be antagonistic. He's a hostile force that directly attacks the player. Don't touch that dial now, we're just getting started, the broadcaster says mockingly. Then in what could be interpreted as both friendly advice, as earlier Silent Hill radios could be relied on to do when monsters got close, or yet another bit of mocking commentary, he says, Look behind you. I said, look behind you. In this way, the radio broadcaster here is utilizing the idea of hauntology, an artifact that is haunted both by previous entries in the series, as well as intermediality, but finally as a subversion of the very function of the radio itself. Commercial radios are only supposed to be receivers, but somehow the broadcaster knows what's going on in the house, and that something's up. The radio is a symbol of secondariness. In other words, listening to the radio can be done while you are also doing something else. It taunts you while you are being forced to play the game. Listening to it is no act of relief. Instead, it is a reinforcer of the corridor's simple horror. The radio broadcast also pays homage to a haunting that exists on radio, which in part admittedly feels apocryphal in terms of people's reactions. The famous War of the Worlds radio play that allegedly terrified listeners. The radio in PT references this, albeit in Swedish, saying, Yes, the radio drama from 75 years ago was true. They are here on our earth and they monitor and see all. Don't trust anyone, don't trust the police. They are already controlled by them. That's the way it has been for 75 years now. Only our best will prevail. You have a right. A right to become one of us. So, welcome to our world. Very soon the gates to a new dimension will open. 204-863. 204-863. This connection to a real event makes the game's horror feel deeper and stand out further. Quantologically, we connect to this event, even if we've never studied or read up on it deeply before. It is a famous event in radio history, and as such there's likely some reference or another to it that we've experienced or heard of in our lives. It is another fascinating piece of P.T.'s puzzle. The radio plays one final role. Dawn Stobart describes radio's power as relating to the non-specificity of sound. With no visual reference to substantiate sound, it has the ability to act upon the imagination of the listener who makes an audio event as terrible, or not, as their own imagination decides. Where other horror games might try and use a flashback scene or use visuals and imagery, PT's radio is perfectly suited in its role. Stobart continues, saying, During a well-written and well-performed audio drama, the listener feels that the story is being told to them, but that it is also being told for them and them alone. Wearing a pair of earphones heightens the situation, constructing an environment that seems to include the listener in its drama as if they are being spoken to directly. It's another masterstroke in what is a very clever and very haunted video game. But what I really wanted to talk about today is the almost fanatical quality of the remakes and demakes that have been created around PT. The desire to reconstruct, to salvage, to save, to archive. Human nature itself summoned by PT in the face of Konami's recklessly destructive act. The name PT itself is a haunting. It means playable teaser. It is for 99% of people now unplayable. It is also a teaser for something that will never come out. The name itself is now an artifact, something dead. The desire to resurrect it is thus strong. It is so emotionally effective. It is a story of a murdered family and the player who must suffer for the sins of the father, who probably is the protagonist, suffering endlessly at the hands of his vengeful wife. It is terrifying. It is also lost. Which is why that fact which haunts us also, drives some to the extreme length to save and memorialize the game in their own way. Hyper PT is perhaps the most interesting of all the demakes for the way in which it acts as a direct link to a now defunct technology. Running only on an emulation for an old Macintosh home computer, HyperPT was developed for the HyperCard system, hence the name. HyperCard, originally released in 1987 as proprietary software for Macintosh computers, acts essentially as a stack of virtual cards running on top of each other. Imagine essentially a virtual Rolodex, 
or perhaps a flip book. Each card contains a prescribed, hard-coded set of interactive objects, including text fields, checkboxes, and other common, similar GUI elements. Users browse the stack by navigating from card to card, using built-in navigation features, a powerful search mechanism, or through user-created scripts. In the case of HyperPT, the game is moved through entirely with mouse clicks. The eeriness of PT is accentuated by HyperPT's soundlessness, where modern horror games often rely on the sound ambience and a dark, rich soundscape to truly immerse a player in the experience. HyperPT is surreal in its silence, jarring in that absence of sound. Trudging through the halls is accompanied by nothing but slow shifts in perspective, as though you are moving through the game in a lagging virtual reality on some level of abstract. Playing on such an old, antiquated system adds the classic layer to horror that you are playing or watching something lost or otherwise forbidden. It's a double layer there, of course, with PT, given that the actual game is lost and forbidden by Konami. That feeling is crucial to many different pieces of horror media because it gives you a feeling of profound isolation, as though you are the one person on Earth experiencing these things in the moment. Horror often relies on the sense that you are totally alone to work its magic. Hyper PT is particularly effective about this. The black and white color palette feels so sparse and isolating, and the few things you can interact with have so little information that everything that happens to you feels strangely disjointed. Yet the game's major set pieces are recreated with loving detail. One of those set pieces is the bit where the bathroom door shudders against the weight of Lisa's fists, or perhaps her head as she slams herself against it except this time, soundlessly. The lack of sound again creates a dissonant feeling, as though the game itself is broken. It is a version of PT utterly divorced from modern sensibilities, yet, at the same time, is haunted by the design conventions of the thing that preceded and inspired it. PT is itself, like many survival horror games, at its core, a point-and-click adventure. Find the item you need to interact with, and then interact with another point in the environment with that object in the correct way. PT's elegance just strips away any excess gameplay elements and leaves you with just that. That and the terror, of course. Hyper PT takes that stripping down of excess a step further, leaving you with truly the bare minimum. D makes are in unique positions because they seek to reconstruct a more modern game in the style of an older one. This may be for several reasons. Is the developer chasing a personal kind of nostalgia for the thing they are demaking, and the platform they are demaking it to? There's a huge trend on YouTube for demade PSX games, clearly because there's a strong nostalgia and connection for the aesthetic. But at the same time, playable demakes serve a really valuable purpose for us as players. They enable us to reread the original text in a totally different way, remade in a different light by a different author. Hyper PT does away with a lot of extra set dressing and information. There is no radio, and the pictures are totally uninteractable. There's not even any time on the clock, nor any rain pattering at the windows. Yet the game's intense focus on the single hallway gives that hallway a different kind of power. Where the original PT relied on what felt like an absurd level of detail to colour that single hallway, allowing the player to notice subtle shifts in the way it presented itself and changed from loop to loop, Hyper PT lets the player luxuriate in a single feeling, the surreality of the whole experience. Playing a hypercard game in 2023 is itself a strange experience. When we speak of demakes, we also speak of time and deconstruction. Time is a construct, but from the perspective of hauntology, time is not linear. It is deconstructed, and any presence of a strong concept that would stabilize it is impossible. PT thus exists out of time. It connects us to the past and an undefined but fearful future. The game recreates three other notable set pieces, each one given a hypercard spin. That is to say, it is softened, each moment not quite as frightening, but still strangely haunting. The first is checking the bathroom door after it opens a crack. The game then summons a set of white pixels out of the dark for what feels like less than a second before the door slams shut. This inclusion is so quiet, yet so beautiful for its minimalistic approach, that I felt surprisingly pleased with the moment in the game as it is presented. You remember the bit in PT where a bit of railing crashes down from the balcony above you? If you flick a glance up, you see Lisa grinning balefully down at you, her one good eye accompanying her empty socket, a black void that reminds you of the pain she has been through. 
She is, in that moment, a figure of pure evil. Even if you know that on one level she herself has suffered, she seems like a spirit of total malevolence, more a force of nature than anything else. Her relentless toying with you is something that is presumed will go on forever. You will never escape this hallway. Hyper PT recreates this moment by chance. Flick a glance up at the right time, and a pair of twinkling eyes gaze down at you for just another quiet moment. It is genuinely discomforting, though again not in the same way as the original game's moment. I swear that, even after the glowing white pixels have faded away, you can still see her watching you. As you may know by now, Lisa in the original game locks onto you, following directly behind you all the time. She projects her shadow in front of you, and if you ever hear her behind you, it's not the game bluffing. She is right behind you. For me, the bit where I could still see Lisa's eyes glowing down at me was a haunting of that previous moment. Hauntology is in this moment relinking memories, connecting ideas across two very different technological spectrums. There is a reason that lo-fi, liminal, or other kinds of ideas can be said to evoke a horror aesthetic. They are themselves haunting, capable not just of stirring memories, but of generating fear. Demakes could also be considered objects worthy of criticism a sign of stagnation. An English theorist, Mark Fisher, called this concept cancelled futures and associated it with cultural stagnation. In a 2014 lecture, he bemoaned little forward progress in music and films and endless repetition and recycling of old ideas, just in high definition. Not that I agree with this idea when it comes to demakes, but it is an interesting point to consider. The recycling of events, of ideas, is subconsciously hauntological. We are consumed by a desire to understand the past, and are so consumed by it that we often let it haunt our future. Is our fixation on remaking things harmful? Perhaps not always, but perhaps it is sometimes, in some sense, damaging. Remaking or demaking is thoroughly cyclical, as we mine from the haunted territory of the past to create a ghostly image of the present, or perhaps even the future. The question that we need to answer, that we might never be able to answer, Is that good for us? Does remaking merely increase our appreciation and fondness for the original? Or do remakes have the quality to contribute new and quality readings of the original work instead? It is of course a case-by-case process to try and answer that, but our luxuriating and glorifying of the old is, I think, generally a troubling fixity in much of our modern mainstream art consumption. The final set piece that HyperPT reconstructs is simulated with text box pop-ups. At one point in the game, the game says, in text box format, look behind you. So you look behind you and see nothing. You feel a bit paranoid, but you carry on. Later in the game, the game reminds you forcefully, I said, look behind you. Again, you might try to obey, but again, nothing. So you approach the door to end that particular loop through the hallway, but then Lisa appears soundlessly in your screen, her face fixed in a rictus grin, which slowly cycles out, fading into nothing. This is where the game's cleverest aspect comes in. The game spits you back out to the emulator's main screen, where you will have just loaded Hyper PT from about five minutes before. I genuinely hover between the quit button and whether to have another go. Eventually, about 15 seconds of deliberating on my first playthrough, I went to open Hyper PT again. That's when a strange message popped up on my screen, I'll call later, in six different languages. Like the original game's death and respawn in the basement room, The sequence is a fourth wall break that makes the player question their own security. Is the game really over? Is the game ever really closed? The I'll call later is an allusion to the game, or Lisa, getting in contact with you in reality. Silent Hills had a rumoured feature that the game would contact you on your cell phone. If it had done so, it would have been an unprecedented level of fourth wall breaking that would have kept players on their toes even after the game was shut down, or even after the game was quote-unquote complete. Much like the titular room in Stephen King's short story 1408, the game would have continued to toy with your sense of reality, corroding traditional boundaries in video games, and opening the player up to unexpected levels of intrusion. Perhaps it would have been an unwelcome feature, but it is worth thinking about. The game, after you see the I'll call later message, just drops you back in for one more loop. No more scares, just the ability to open the door and leave the house. You see the ending message. No more cryptic hints. Just that warning. I'll call later. Don't forget now. Pick up the phone. The technology you're playing around with today will be the derelict statues of Ozymandias tomorrow. 
Yet, despite their defunct qualities, they still have the ability to haunt, to be played on. What other media will be left behind? And who will save that media when comes time for such things to wither and die? Will there be a Windows 10 developer in 2063? A project that I would not envy anyone, to reconstruct PT in an almost authoritative way. PT is a game with so many subtle moving parts and intricacies that to try and piece together the game its entirety, especially in how good the game looked, seems an impossibility. The game was deeply immersive and graphically gorgeous, the way the rain droplets rolled down window panes, the way in which the random junk and detritus was scattered around the cupboards, the way in which the light shone in the foyer, and the terrifyingly jerky way that Lisa moves. That movement, itself taken from the jerky movement of earlier Silent Hill games of monsters, is an integral part of the game's look and feel. It connects it on a subconscious, subliminal level to those other games. So the task of Unreal PT is to essentially replace PT. Though, of course, that was not the intent behind the project, as far as I'm aware, but rather, it acts as one of the most accessible and one of the nearest to one-to-one -one recreation of the game that thus exists. Even though Konami also took the hatchet to Unreal PT as well. This is, of course, the internet. I won't say anything more than that. Instead, I'll discuss the purpose and feel of a one-to-one -one remake of the most viscerally memorable horror title ever. As a reconstruction of actual evil, Unreal PT functions masterfully. Better still, it is playable with a VR headset meaning you can finally immerse yourself in the cursed hallway, just like you've always wanted to do. Just... just me then? Okay. But it's hard to fault the accomplishments of the now invisible developer. As far as I could tell, they've been erased from the internet beyond his name being attached to articles about the remake. Whatever their process, the fact that they were able to reconstruct the game in Unreal Engine speaks volumes about the talent on offer. To salvage a game, to truly save it, is a one-to-one -one recreation really necessary? Perhaps in the case of PT, it is. PT is a truly lost game. If you didn't install it on a PS4 back when it was available in the PlayStation Store, you're out of luck until someone, somewhere, figures out how to hack a PS4 open to install .pkg files on it. So recreations and remakes are as close as new audiences can ever get to one of the fabled horror game holy grails. Unreal PT has a few interesting, if minor, changes from the original game as far as I can tell, that, while they don't dilute the experience in any real way, could be construed as slightly inferior to the original experience. The house is messier than the original game, presented with a slightly more authentic level of grime and clutter. The assets exude a slightly darker aesthetic, and, obviously due to the fact that the original PT was developed by a team of people with what is presumably a longer period of time and a much larger budget, Cordello obviously couldn't quite get it perfect. Lisa's jump scare and character model in particular doesn't feel quite as good or as terrifying. The jerky movements aren't quite the same, and the frantic movements of the camera in the original aren't quite replicated in Unreal PT when Lisa grabs you and snaps your neck. There isn't the little three-circle loading symbol in the bottom right corner of the screen that was the first hint that PT was connected to Silent Hill in the first place. So while Unreal PT is certainly still capable of generating profound fear, it isn't quite right. But for those who haven't played PT before, the differences are negligible and practically invisible. Unreal PT achieves what I would have imagined at one point to be unachievable, and recreates the aura of PT with just a sliver of the original game's glory removed. But it still functions as a recreation of a lost artifact, one of the most playable and the most accessible of any of the recreations. Even if Radius Gordello has apparently been turned to dust by Konami's lawyers, they leave behind in dusty corners of the internet a remarkable game that allows people to play through PT for the first time and experience what are essentially the same thrills, or the same kinds of thrills. The most important factor in this remake is, in my opinion, the VR mode, which changes how you approach the game. Where before there is at least a small veneer of distance from you in the game, a practiced horror player can at least try to build a barrier between themselves in the events of the game, for instance. When you stick your head in the VR helmet, there really is a sense of total submersion. 
immersion in video games is a really special something, but it also has links to other forms of entertainment and media. This is all thanks to a cognitive process which scholar Angus Fletcher calls the stretch. The stretch, as he describes it, is the invention at the root of all literary wonder, the marvel that comes from stretching regular objects into metaphors, the dazzle that comes from stretching regular rhythms of speech into poetic meters, and the awe that comes from stretching regular humans into heroes. The stretch, in virtual reality terms, is the extension of an already immersive video game space to become something truly consumptive. As Fletcher also says, the stretch is a simple device, but its effects on our brain can be profound. It's been linked in modern psychology labs to a shift of neural attention that flings our focus outward, decreasing activity in our parietal lobe, a brain region associated with mental representations of ourself. The result is that we quite literally feel the borders of ourself dissolving, even to the point of self-annihilation. As we self-annihilate, we step into the shoes of the character. As we become the character, we can become even more deeply affected by the emotions or the imagery presented in the work. In something like PT, it already achieves this emotive effect without putting a VR headset on at all. But by putting a virtual reality headset on, there is almost no degree of separation if you are an experienced VR user. If it's your first go, then maybe you're more worried about how the headset works than immersing yourself in the game. But the moment you become comfortable with it, you notice in most players of VR games that they are immersed in a way that can only be achieved by supplying the digital world everywhere they look. This is thanks to another process that we can divide handily into two categories. PI, the place illusion, and PSI, the plausibility illusion, as defined by a scholar called Slater. The so-called PI, which is defined as the strong illusion of being in a place in spite of the sure knowledge that you are not there, allows players to perceive the virtual environment as reality. In addition to the PI, whereby the VR environment is perceived as being real, the PSI focuses on the depicted events as being real. PSI can be described otherwise as the illusion that what is happening is real, even though you know that it is not real. Janet Murray describes immersion as a psychologically immersive experience, as a sensation of being surrounded by a completely other reality, as different as water is from air, that takes over all of our attention, our whole perceptual apparatus. When we are hyper-focused on a work, we lose all sense of time, and our brain actually shuts off signals that tell us to eat, drink, or even go to the bathroom. When we snap out of an immersive work of art, we can find ourselves hungry, thirsty, and needing to head to the toilet. That's just because our brain has been focusing intensely on one particularly immersive task. The best kinds of experiences in horror games are these experiences, when you can swear your own self has been annihilated and the character is you. But immersing oneself in PT seems like a bad idea. But it's okay. As I said before, Unreal PT is a little janky. The seams show at times, despite Gordello's fantastic and vital efforts. So what if we went a step further? What if we played a version of PT, in VR, that utilised all of the original assets, put together in a meticulous way? It exists, in fact, and it is a true test of one's bravery. What does it mean to recreate an entire game literally using the assets available in the original game. If it were any other title but PT, surely we would call it fraud, asset flipping, thievery, plagiarism, or any number of other synonyms that describe the appropriation of another's work. But then, as we have already discussed, PT is not your average game. The act of total reconstruction of copying is not an act of thievery, surely, when the thing has already been stolen, or worse, annihilated. In this case, PT emulation is like picking up the remnants of a painting and slowly stitching it back together. It might not be quite the same, but what more can be done for it? PT is a frightening game, no surprise there. We have a lot of reactions to fear. We tend to break such reactions down into two separate categories, cognitive and non-cognitive. Most of the studies regarding these two reactions have actually been mostly on children, but they can still be theoretically relevant to adults. Non-cognitive strategies include physical activities, such as grabbing an attachment object, leaning on significant others, walking out of the situation, becoming involved in another activity, or eating and drinking. Another effective strategy is to directly cover one's eyes to avoid the frightening depictions of the media content. However, Wilson, in a study from 1989, 
reported that covering one's eyes is effective for younger children, but is of limited benefit for older children. Older children found that the continuous audio from a program still made them feel less in control and more vulnerable when they covered their eyes, thus providing limited ability to distract them and to help them reduce their fear. Yet when we are inside a VR headset, taking it off is an even more deliberate act than covering one's eyes or simply deciding to pause the game. Coping mechanisms sadly aren't available to all of us, especially if we are exposed to things we aren't developmentally ready for. For example, media content affects children's sleep or thoughts and causes enduring and life-lasting traumatic experiences. So a VR experience being so immersive can theoretically be like this as well. VR feels almost like an entrapment, an encirclement of the player totally, and that mental roadblock encourages genuine fear. When we're out of a VR headset, we often afford ourselves a degree of separation between ourselves and what we're seeing on the screen and what the character is undergoing, even subconsciously. This isn't always necessarily true, some games are remarkably immersive, but is more of a generalization that we can probably argue is generally true. When we get close to horrific elements, we start to see that element of self-annihilation kick in. We might understand as a heightened haptic proximity to the horror, and this heightened effect of horror under the conditions of VR betrays the need for a new perceptual metaphor. It is no longer a frame, a mirror, or a window, but rather a door through which the faculties of perception cross over to within the digesis of the digital realm. It does not matter if an individual is consciously aware of the digital artifice. Perceptual immersion amplifies the horror. Thus, the so-called suspension of disbelief phenomenon upon which cinematic realism trades in its creation of transportation becomes irrelevant. It is only the immersive nature of the viewing experience that matters. Moreover, the ludological connection to the avatar transcends the need for identification as it is understood in the conventional debate. Under the conditions of first-person VR, the perception of the player merges with the physical space of the avatar without a screen of separation, window, frame, or mirror. There's something to be said for this idea now, that the self-identification of the protagonist as an element isn't even relevant at this point. You have in fact transcended this and ended up without a degree of separation. So if we're so close to the game, what attempts to separate ourselves from the terrifying sights we see are there? Well, in PT and VR, there's just about nothing. Remember how I said PT was painfully simple with just walking in the idea of looking closer as the one and only game mechanic? The idea of looking closer at something you don't really want to see is just a further immersive aspect to the game. You can't defend yourself in the game. There's no consoling yourself that control over your situation is possible. PT is remarkable in that even in a safe space, the hallway before Lisa actually spawns for instance, you feel remarkably unsafe. PT is an untethered haunting nightmare. Lisa is everywhere and the sickening presence of the house itself is actually nauseating in VR and not just because of motion sickness. Closing your eyes still means the sounds can be heard. Repetitions of it's not real hardly seem to prop yourself up when everywhere you look you see it. Self-talk often takes a humorous tone when someone is scared by a horror game when they're in a group, or even if they're alone. Making fun of a terrifying situation is often how humans cope with stress. Yet how far can you actually separate yourself and make fun when a twitching Lisa appears in the corridor and starts moving towards you? Not the screen, you. PT seems fantastically hard to make fun of because it is so simple. There's no silliness really or broken glitchiness to hide yourself behind. There is just the house. There is just Lisa. It is also important to recognize the place of graphical fidelity in PT. PT is not necessarily super realistic or totally high fidelity. Kojima himself said that he kept the game at 30 FPS for instance to make the game appear like it was made by a less experienced or even an indie developer to help build the impression that it was a game from nowhere that had previously been charted. Simulationally speaking, PT is not complex mechanically. Yet, like all the best horror, it contains, at least for a middle-class, suburban, and or western audience, an element of quote-unquote universal truth. It relies on the semiotics of suburbia, subliminal ideas about a suburban home, or what we understand to be one, and feeds into those ideas relentlessly. It utilizes what we can call personal and cultural hauntology, constructing a lived-in environment that allows us to recognize and automatically react to our own ideas of suburbia. Through these ideas, immersion is instantaneous, and thus the representation of a hallway becomes no longer solely digital, 
but partly imaginative. As a metaphor for routine and unending torment, the looping hallway haunts us with its dreadful simplicity. Returning to Stobart's work, she outlines a methodology for identifying perspective identification in video games further. She says that the first person perspective can be divided into two sections, quasi anonymous and identified. Identified is where we play as a named or otherwise more solidly predefined character. In almost every instance, this results in a greater narrative distance from said character. But when a character is quasi anonymous, they are left relatively open for a player to imprint upon. Anonymity reflects both visual and verbal signifiers, she says, meaning that the character often isn't named and we don't get to see even how the character looks. Talking about Gone Home, Stobart says that at no point in the game is the player explicitly given the identity of the protagonist, yet playing the game allows a character to emerge, heavily mediated by the player's interpretation. This sounds an awful lot like PT, and it is through that understanding that we achieve a complex understanding of our own selves, our anonymized protagonist, and how they relate to the game. Even with no explicit signifiers, we often connect dots and narrative eyes on our own. So when we play PT emulation, we connect with the alleged real representation of PT and can connect all the same dots in all the same ways as the original PT on PlayStation 4 as it released back in 2014. We immerse ourselves in the same way. We reconstruct the environment in the same way. We engage with it on perhaps an even higher level than the original when we play in VR. I know I certainly did. Typical methods of disengagement from frightening positions are, as I have proven, harder to disengage from in virtual reality when you are surrounded by an immersive environment and your brain identifies what is around you as your current reality or the thing that you should be in a state of hyper-focus about. Yet we are still left with a small, niggling question in the back of our minds as we play through this emulated PT. Is it really real? Is it really PT? Is playing this through a totally equal experience to the PlayStation 4 original? It feels like a ship of Theseus paradox. Even if the work is, piece by piece, constructed from the same bits, if it was not reconstructed by the same artist's hands, is the purpose and intent still the same? This is not a question I pose that is intended to have a defined and definite answer. It is instead a prompt for you to consider. PT emulation is a remarkably well done job. A game that, for all intents and purposes, is the very same PT played and adored back in 2014. It is an essential piece of archival, a saving of an essential part of horror video gaming. Yet what a terrible shame it is that it is even necessary. Who feels nostalgia for the Game Boy? Well, not me, as I am myself a PlayStation and PC person. I'm one of those regretful people who sadly never got a chance to own a Nintendo console despite knowing so many people being fondly connected to those systems. I was envious of them at times, as I am sure they were envious of me at other times. So approaching 204863, the number repeated over and over again by the radio broadcaster and PT, was something coloured with interesting emotion for me. It is almost, I think, a form of cultural osmosis through which I understood this Game Boy D-Mate. Its colour palette is a simple monochrome, four-shade set of greens, and without any kind of complex sound. It also operates entirely on a 2D plane, and, uniquely for the set of games I'm looking at today, is from the third person perspective. You control little pixel Norman Reedus as he makes his way through the cyclical hallway, and identification is much, much different than the first person games we've just spoken about. Whereas in the other titles, self-identification with the protagonist was a form of total self-annihilation, we're given a form of identification for the protagonist of 204863. He is definably identified as Norman Reedus by a little pixel portrait for dialogue right at the beginning of the game as he wakes up, replicating that famous shot in the Silent Hills trailer where the character turns around to reveal that Reedus is the star. But what I find most interesting is that 204863 does away with the pretense that who you are playing as is a secret, basically out of necessity. The framing device has to be entirely different, and the mystery of what is going on is perhaps slightly lessened contextually. But that is not to say that what 204863 does is irrelevant. The radio plays a more central role, locking itself in as something to be interacted with rather than passively engaged with secondarily as I outlined at the start of this video. 
By nature of the fact that all information must be delivered visually, or through text pop-ups in a Game Boy remake or demake, the radio becomes a more prominent device, something that must be interacted with instead of just being able to walk past or passively absorbed. Perhaps my favourite part of this demake is the art. The way Lisa is presented is absolutely fantastic. Not sure how they managed to reconstruct the terrifying facial features of Lisa so accurately in the simple shades of Game Boy colouring, but her trademark sneer, vomit running down her chin, and in the jump scare her bulging, hateful blank eye are recreated perfectly. There is something to be said for demade art when it can evoke the same emotions as the real thing. It is thoroughly repulsive and does so without the same immersive quality that the other games have to their advantage. What 204863 does well besides the art is the reframing of certain puzzles. The puzzles, which in other reconstructions and the original PT, relied more on looking than on action, are given more physical spins here. One puzzle requires you to push a bloody fridge into the right place on the floor so that the door will unlock. The game is given more physicality and more player character distance. Fox Harrell reminds us potently that imagination is not just in the head. Imaginative cognition involves the body due to reliance on sensory perception and motor action in the case of interactive systems, other people, artifacts, environments, and immediate situations at hand. Giving the player an opportunity to move things and interact with the game world affects our imaginative state just as much as non-physical interactions do. Even imagination is coloured by reality and our own social status and lived experience. Perhaps you would gravitate immediately towards 204863 if you grew up with the Game Boy in your hands. Perhaps you would understand it more implicitly than I do, feel it more deeply than I do, as a part of yourself. This is all because imagination allows for immersion, but imagination also allows for a deeply haunted life. Signs and symbols everywhere, such as the abstracted suburbia I discussed in the last segment, are interpreted in different ways depending on where you're coming from. Yet more universal symbols are more universally understood, and thus more universally received. In the case of PT, the repetition of the story being told colours our approach to each remake and each demake. With each successive play or rereading, the game has the potential to become less frightening, or at least less mysterious. This video is, in itself, a form of demystification. Yet it is not a defined authority on the game. I am not the end point. By speaking as I do, I should not be erasing your own thoughts and meditations on PT. Instead, I hope I am challenging you to think more broadly about the representational quality of the video games you engage with yourself. Why has a developer given the character a strong voice, or even just allowed us to see their body? Is it because we are expected to identify with them, or are we expected to be distant from them? 204863 story is not particularly effective. If you were to play PT for the first time, 204863 would probably not stand so well on its own. It is a referential text indeed, a demake for fans of horror that also overlaps with fans of the original Game Boy, but this does not reduce its power. In fact, it is a valuable text because it emphasizes that every form of video game has its own particular power and strengths and weaknesses. 204863 leans into the uncanny and the pixelated. It recreates the story of PT, but does it in a way that many video game players will probably be familiar with, or at least culturally aware of. From there, we can ask how we feel about such a recreation, and whether an older style of presentation makes us feel less afraid but more fond of the game, or perhaps for some of us, it might be the other way around. Does old media, old technology, have the capacity to haunt us beyond just what we see on it? Perhaps it is the memories that we have lost that we fear the most. The things that can stir those memories, like some eldritch spoon in the Tower of Online, are particularly potent. 204863 reminds us that we can always get in touch with those old, sometimes decrepit memories, for better or for worse. The only me is me. Are you sure? The only you is you. Reductive. Reductive. That is a word I sometimes fear, and even at times loathe to reduce a work of art. That surely seems almost worse than destroying it entirely. By reducing it, you limit its power and distort the intent of the creator and the depth that the reader can bring to it. To fit it into a tiny box, to say that a work of art should only be experienced in one way, that is surely a crime. Yet reducing, as in the case of Hyper PT, can almost be a refocusing. 
Mobile PT is a little silly, but it is true to the essence of PT. Mobile PT's reduction in this case is of the pure horror atmosphere and the graphical fidelity, but much to the developer's credit, Mobile PT is wonderfully playable and a lot of fun. Mobile PT is the game I will finish with on this video. It is a curious game, almost. In some sense, it is a parody title. This becomes painfully clear when you boot up the game. While the original opening message of The only me is me, are you sure the only you is you, is soundless, inviting the player to read it in their own voice and further self-identify with the character, we get a bit of a goofily toned voice reading it out for us. Mobile PT encourages us to lower our guard with this. Even better is the radio static as you wake up, being just a guy going <coughs> which gave me a big smile on my face. The hallway itself is not presented as realistically either. As far as I could tell, the original game had what looks like a picture of George Lucas on the countertop next to the phone at the first corner of the hallway. In Mobile PT, there is a picture of Conan O'Brien hanging from the wall. There are also sketches of snowmen and other little goofy cartoon pictures that make you lower your guard even further. The radio broadcaster, voiced by the same person who read out the opening message, in the same tone, even stumbles over his lines in a few places. All of this contributes to the fact that Mobile PT feels much more like a comedic deconstruction of PT. Yet remarkably, the game still manages to build an unsettling atmosphere, but this time the main tool used is the juxtaposition of cartoonish voice acting and graphics with the still disturbing events that occur in the game. What is really interesting is that Mobile PT changes nothing around in terms of how the game unfolds and what you need to do to progress. You still need to look at the letters HAL to pass through a door. You still need to see a crying fetus baby that only has one sound effect in this one, so it repeats the same cry over and over again in some disturbing siren wail, and peer into the crack of the bathroom door so that Lisa's oddly circular face can appear in front of you and give you a wee fright. It impresses me just how well movement is created, how lovingly it is reconstructed. The jump scare replicates exactly the same kind of weight and movement of the original games, with the difference being the low poly model of Lisa. One big difference is how the music no longer feels like a natural ambient kind of noise that you would expect the house to make. Just as the game's graphical quality has been downgraded, the music now feels extra diegetic rather than coming from within the game world. Quite often, we mistake better graphics for a better game. Oftentimes, in fact, we can argue that as graphics improve or otherwise stay the same, that the world itself reflects this fact, that everything is chugging along okay, progress is being made. But graphics that are pushing back to an earlier time implies in some way a regression, but it need not be necessarily a bad or a needless regression. It sends a message of disruption or subversion, perhaps one of we are going backwards, not forwards. The horror genre has for so long been tied up in the legacy of PT, for good reason, but not always with a good outcome. Mobile PT feels like a release of that legacy. A way to poke fun at a legendary game that has inspired countless like me to engage with the game on a critical level and understand what makes it tick. Comedy and horror are often cited as natural partners because they work in similar ways, just in opposite directions. Jokes often have your usual kind of setup slash fall down element, where the fall down part is the punchline that is meant to be unexpected and you know, make you laugh. Horror games are most poised to take control of the unexpected simply by virtue of their emergent nature. Emergent, ludic horror is something I have long championed and PT is one of the finest. Mobile PT doesn't miss out on this opportunity. It makes it abundantly clear when Lisa has spawned behind you as her shadow projects visibly onto the wall in front of you. Her clomping footstep or footsteps are painfully audible and when she jump scares you it is totally unpredictable, much like the original game. PT's jump scare springs just after you've lowered your guard, and which is what makes it so effective. And appearing from nowhere after so much delicious build-up, PT remains terrifying, and some element of it can remain unpredictable even in new and humorous forms. Mobile PT proves this with flair as well as a tongue firmly planted in its cheek. Though it plays some parts seriously, such as the bloody fridge and the general decay of reality in the hallway, everything feels wrong here still, and it is up to individual players whether it feels more or less wrong as we get distance from photorealism. Do we afford a lower graphical fidelity more imaginative power, or do we become less immersed? I personally am of the mind that imagination can be powered by gaps in detail, and that the less we know, the more we think about it. Hence the existence of this video, there was much I didn't know, and much I wanted to ruminate on. Surely one of the cleverest and coolest recreations of PT that so far exists. 
It challenges us once again on what we value from horror and actually how horror can be presented. It doesn't have to be dark and gloomy 100% of the time, it just has to be immersive. And as the light creaks and the rain patters gently down on the ceiling, even a low poly reconstruction of the hallway and a one tone baby shriek can be horrifyingly effective. We don't need radically fancy technology to be frightened. In fact, the basis of being haunted by video games comes from the things we bring to the game. Mobile PT, when it isn't inducing a silly grin, is shaking us to the core by pointing us to PT as presented in a dream that you once had. The loss of a work of art so well constructed, or as well loved as PT, would always have been a tragedy, regardless of what shape it actually took. But its impact and desire to play it again has been so great that people will resurrect it in their own ways. The remarkable quality of PT is that it inspires such fervour in people, even years later, that, much like the ghost of Lisa, can forever stalk the hallways of our collective consciousness. Yet every time it is remade, it becomes something new, something is added to it, perhaps something is even removed. As we are all haunted by the knowledge that digital media and digital artworks can be so easily lost, and are lost every moment of every day, we must surely now look to preserving the artworks that are close to being lost. We must surely wonder what will happen when the internet is inevitably upgraded wholesale. What happens then to our digital archives and our catalogues? What happens to games that can no longer run on more modern hardware? What happens when emulators stop being supported and die out? PT, despite its many other remarkable qualities, has that as perhaps its most potent, lasting question. It asks us, can we save anything? Or is the human experience always so fleeting that we end up haunted by everything we have done? But ultimately all things are just memory, and memory dies with us. Even in PT, purgatory ends. The front door opens, everything comes spilling out. And then, oblivion. Thanks to everyone who has supported me thus far. Thanks to everyone who watched this goliath of a video through to the end. It is a love letter to a game and a series which has intertwined itself inseparably from my heart and soul. I hope in this small way I can stave off oblivion and annihilation and reconjure the amazing emotive qualities of PT, Silent Hill and horror video gaming at its most imaginative peaks. A special thanks to my patrons, Frank Alones and Future Cityscape. You make this possible and you inspire me to keep going on. If you want to be given a shout out in these videos for up to three days early access to my videos, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. They do a lot of hard work and a lot of writing and research and editing to make these videos the very, very best that, uh, that they can be. The link is in the description. Thanks again, everyone. Stay safe. And remember, don't touch that dial now. We're just getting started. Look behind you. I said, look behind you. After killing his family, the father hung himself with a garden hose they had in the garage. 204863. 204863.